Right before the start of Season 4 during the preseason update in 2013, Yasuo the Unforgiven was released. His reception was met with a lot of controversy. He was a manaless champion with a passive that doubled his crit chance, allowing him to reach max crit rate with just two items, and he gained a shield simply by walking around. His Q and E were both extremely low cooldown abilities, the former granting him strong wave clear and damage while the latter gave him almost unparalleled mobility in the right circumstances. W was his most infamous attack, creating a wall that would intercept and destroy every projectile that collided with it. And if that wasn't enough, his ultimate was a long-range blink attack that struck any airborne enemies with bonus damage, upon which he would gain a 15 second, 50% bonus armor penetration buff. At the time of his release, the community thought he was one of the most outlandish designs Riot had ever conceived, but his launch was indicative of something more important. Ever since, champion designs have continuously increased in complexity and personality to truly solidify their playstyle as their own. Gone were the days when every skirmisher played almost exactly the same. From this moment onwards, League of Legends champions were defined not only by their visuals, but by their playstyle and theme. This new contemporary philosophy is what gave rise to lots of interesting designs that have cemented champions as individuals and not archetypes. Gnar, an adorable, feisty little yordle who would transform into a raging kaiju thingamaduhiki. Azir, a champion who commands an army of sand soldiers to fight in his stead. Kalista, a marksman with the ability to reposition herself with each attack. Rek'Sai, who digs a system of tunnels throughout the map. Bard, a weirdo. While some of them may have developed a reputation for being too strong or too weak during their time, their unique playstyles and gimmicks were a breath of fresh air. Instead of following a template, the design team was able to explore and experiment with different ideas and try all sorts of crazy innovations. Seasons 4 through 6 would forever alter the landscape of the game going forward. But as time progressed, what was once creative, outside-of-the-box concepts, counterculture if you will, gradually became the culture in and of itself. Champions were trying harder and harder to stand out from one another, to have the next flashy or crazy mechanic, and along with that came ability spreads that were packed with copious amounts of detail and nuance as a way to emphasize their individuality, that they could do what no one else could. This proverbial benchmark of what was expected from newer champions kept getting pushed higher and higher, leading many players within the community to question if champion designs have gone too far. Today, we're going to discuss the prevalence of overloaded champions, how they came to be, what led up to the rising number of them, and why this poses a problem for new champions in the future. Now, some of you may have seen the videos on this channel regarding the problem with new champions, and might be wondering if this is a repeat. Despite my constant discussions about overloaded kits, I legitimately never made an actual video, like explaining what overloaded even means or gave it a standalone episode, which is what today is for. Overloaded is a term thrown around a lot recently, even by Riot's own staff. During their annual State of the Game address entering preseason 12, a meme was born. If we're being completely honest, we don't think our champions have overloaded kits overall. Before anything else, I just want to remind you that Safelocked is just the messenger. Her words may not necessarily be her own. So, anyone attacking her directly, you need to shut the hell up. She's reading off a teleprompter, not saying that she personally believes these words. Anyways, the video then went on to say that new champions have been pretty balanced on release with the exception of Dr. Mundo. Obviously, the reactions to the statement were incredulous. Everyone lost their sh as many people colloquially agreed that Dr. Mundo was the least problematic release out of everyone in 2021. But I think what they meant to say was that they don't think the new champions had overtuned kits, which would be factually correct. On release, Gwen, Viego, and Akshan were surprisingly underwhelming. Whether it was due to not being fully understood by the player base or they were just genuinely bad, Performatively, they had some of the worst maiden voyages ever, beginning at around a 35% win rate, maybe even lower. Mundo, on the other hand, came out very strong. At least, I'm hoping that was the message they were trying to convey when they said that. Because after that Mundo sentence, they said healthy gameplay doesn't just give prize win rates and that new champions still feel unfair to play against, so I think they were trying to say they were overtuned. With that in mind, we should probably establish what overloaded means in the context of League and how it differs from overtuned. So, Overloaded denotes a champion whose abilities have effects that essentially do too much, to a point where the numbers attached to those abilities are largely irrelevant most of the time. It can also be used to describe an ability that has way too many attributes that don't contribute to proper usage of it. In order for an Overloaded champion to be balanced, they would have to be several marks lower in strength per ability when compared to champions in the same category. On the other hand, Overtuned simply means the champion's numbers are too high, whether it's base stats, base damage, ability scaling, etc. An overloaded champion does not necessarily entail an overtuned one and vice versa. Also, an overloaded champion doesn't always have to be a convoluted one. You can have an overloaded champion with a playstyle that's easy to understand. One of the finest examples of a champion who was misunderstood as overloaded when they were actually overtuned was Set. After being in relative obscurity for the better part of early season 11, he received a major buff on his haymaker, doubling the bonus AD scaling on the return punch. 
During the peak of the Gore Trigger meta, he would easily grab like 300 bonus AD while having over 4000 health, leading to a massive shield well over 2000 HP, and a counter punch that did close to 100% of the shield's value as true damage when sweet spotted, so 2000 true damage. Because of this, a lot of players complain Set was overloaded since he was able to face tank so much damage while dealing equal amounts in return. As you know now, he's not really all that big of a deal. He was just way too strong in conjunction with Gore Drinker and Sterex, and both have since been nerfed. Set's kit is perfectly fine otherwise. Aside from maybe his ridiculous health regeneration, there aren't any extraneous elements within his abilities. An example of an overloaded champion would be someone like Akshan. While his gameplay may suggest he's not the flashiest or most oppressive champion, his kit perfectly illustrates what overloaded means. Dirty fighting lets him shoot twice with each auto attack, with the second one doing half damage. He can cancel the second shot for a short burst of movement speed. If he strikes the same enemy three times, they take bonus magic damage, and if the target is a champion, he gains a shield. There are four separate aspects to his passive. Avengerang is a boomerang that does damage on the way out and on the way back. If it hits something, the projectile range is extended further, allowing it to theoretically have global range. Any target struck is revealed for one second, and any champion struck gives him a short burst of movement speed. I think you get the point. I'm not going to go over the rest of his stuff since we'd be here forever. Normally, an overloaded ability has a bunch of extra conditions or extra things that it does. Like, an ability does damage, but if it hits a champion, you get a shield. If you use it while doing a backflip, the ability has double the power, but if your ultimate is on cooldown, then it gives you 50% bonus attack speed. But if you use it on the tower, the ability cooldown resets, and if you strike 5 enemies with it, then this happens, or that happens, or yada yada yada. An overloaded champion is similar to modern Yu-Gi-Oh cards that have a billion effects, like Red Eyes Dark Dragoon. He can't be targeted or destroyed by card effects. Once per turn, you can destroy one monster your opponent controls and dish out damage equal to the monster's attack. Oh, and once per turn, you can discard a card to negate a card effect, and if you do, it gains a thousand attack. To clarify, there are some abilities that are needlessly complicated and others whose complexity is justified. Just because an ability has a big description doesn't mean it's overloaded. The semantics can get a little confusing, so you'll have to play it by ear. When in doubt, the more boxes they check off or the more hats they wear, the closer they are to being overloaded. Another way to tell is if it's unclear as to whether or not the countermeasures that are usually employed against their specific archetype are also effective against them. One might look at Zeri's kit and think she's overloaded, but she still dies like any other marksman if you get your hands on her. The same isn't true for the likes of Gwen, who has a surprising amount of AoE damage and anti-range properties, two things that skirmishers normally struggle with. These types of champions have been around for a very long time. It's not endemic to only the past few years. True, the frequency of releases that seem to be way too broken are greater now than ever before. Of the 15 most recent, 7 have been in contention as overloaded at one point or another. Earlier, I mentioned that an overloaded champion would have to be several marks worse than their peers to account for the increased number of options they have. An old example of this is Azir. This guy could do literally anything. He has range, AoE damage, single target damage, dashes, he has zone control, engage, disengage, a shield, his trade combos, he's got all-in damage, he can summon a freaking turret, he's got a strong neutral game, he skills like a beast. All things considered, he was one of the most overloaded releases in the game, and that's saying a lot back in 2014. As a result, his numbers were gutted like crazy. Azir may very well be one of, if not the weakest champion in the early game. He has some of the lowest base stats and base damage purely because they need to suppress his laning phase strength so he doesn't completely steamroll everything. And holy crap, this guy used to have so much stuff in his kit. He used to gain attack speed based on cooldown reduction, his E used to knock up the first enemy champion he collided with, and his ultimate acted like Poppy's W while active. You couldn't dash through it. Azir was like the OG overloaded champion. That transitions us to the next point of discussion. What was the reason champions have become overloaded in the first place? Why does it feel like every new release feels more ostentatious than the ones that came before? It's hard to say really. The line between a complex champion that's well designed and a complex champion that's overloaded is extremely blurry. You look at Rel, she's definitely got more to look at in her abilities than her fellow engaged supports Leona or Nautilus, even though she does more or less the same thing. An early problem of League's champions was how samey they all felt. Regardless of if they were overloaded or not, champions have become way more complex than they used to. Back then, almost everyone had simple kits where every ability did more or less only one thing. Jax's Q jumped to his opponent, W gave his next auto attack more damage, E made him block auto attacks for a bit before stunning enemies around him, and his ultimate gave him armor and magic assist. For most genres, in order for players to be incentivized to explore new content, that content has to grab your attention in some way. It has to be new, stronger, or better than whatever is currently available. It wouldn't really be all that enticing for you to go after that new 200 attack sword when you have a sword with 200 attack already, would it? But if the new sword was 300 attack or had a special property that gave you more range, then that would be a harder sell, right? You have to continuously push the goalpost further and further to incentivize players to keep playing. 
Other games try to suppress power and feature creep through different means like set rotation. Pokemon, for instance, every new region you run into the same generic archetypes. Fire, water, or grass type starter Pokemon, the early normal types like Rotata, Sentra, Zigzagoon, Bidoof, Patrat, Bunnelby, or the early game birds like Pidgey, Hutu, Talo, Starly, P-Dove, Fletchling, or the early bug types like Caterpie, Weedle, Wurmple, so on and so forth. They're usually able to recycle the same things since most of the time, the game doesn't have multiples of the same archetype. There's no version where you can get both Bidoof and Zigzagoon at the start of your playthrough. Of course, League of Legends doesn't have set rotation. Champions from day one are still readily available, which means if a new fighter or tank or mage comes out, they have to find some way to distinguish themselves from the rest of the competition. And the only way to do that for a game like this is through playstyles, attributes, or gimmicks. Aphelios is a champion who has five weapons. Kiana is an assassin who commands different elements. Viego can transform into enemy champions. Akshan can revive people. New champions all have a gimmick of some sort, even the non-overloaded ones. When you have this many different gimmicks coming out, some of them are bound to be on the crazy side. Whenever a new champion is announced, they're given only about one patch cycle to be tested on the PBE, which is barely enough time to limit test, and PBE isn't the best environment to test those limits. So essentially, the champion is conceptualized and then thrown into live servers virtually untested, and Riot can't just be like, oops, sorry, and remove a champion from the game, that would be in poor taste. Whether we like it or not, simple champions are over and done with. Every new release from this point onward will have some really flashy animations, gameplay, and the occasional overloaded champion. That's just how it is. But balancing an overloaded champion is just so difficult according to empirical data. Many of them have sub-50% win rates yet are still very frustrating to go up against because whenever they do have their moments to shine, it feels like you really can't do anything to stop them. As mentioned before, when you put too many things into a champion, there's a high likelihood that whatever forms of counterplay that usually deal with members of their subclass don't work on them. Skirmishers are kept in check by ranged champions, so when you make a skirmisher with anti-ranged properties, that's a key element that would otherwise have kept them balanced. Assassins have poor AoE damage most of the time, so if your team huddles up nice and close, or if you have a tank who can body block, you'll be fine. So, when you make an assassin with extreme AoE damage, that's a big countermeasure gone right there. For this very reason, numbers adjustments on them are different from that of other champions. Obviously for a stat checker like Trindamir, lowering the passive AD bonus he gets on Bloodlust by 20 is a huge blow to him, whereas reducing Yona's base Q damage by 20 won't have as much of an effect. You would have to be significantly harsher on overloaded champions to see a noticeable effect, since their abilities can be used in way more situations. And even then, overloaded champions have lower win rates in light of how many more players are inting on them than carrying, making balancing them even tougher as you're not entirely sure where their true win rate is. So for the most part, Riot over nerfs the champion and they stay in obscurity almost forever as it's too cumbersome to fix them. That's what happened to Ryze, Azir, Aphelios, even Samira at one point. Credit where credit is due, new releases are way more engaging than old ones. For how much I like to trash on Yona, I'd be lying if I said he wasn't fun to play. Overloaded champions can do a lot of things and have flashy gimmicks, so as far as experiences go, you'll have a great time picking them up, as long as you're aware of the fact that it comes at the expense of the enemy team's enjoyment. Also, in Ryze's defense, I think they acknowledge how far they've overstepped. I don't blame them either. Sometimes when you're working on your game, you get all excited and want to do all sorts of fancy shenanigans. You can lose perspective quite easily and overscope or overload on things, especially if your goal is to avoid making new content look like rehashed versions of already existing stuff. Ever since Vex though, they've been doing pretty good. Vex, Zeri, and Renata each started off very strong, easily crossing over 52% win rate on their maiden voyages. But the good news for them is that it's always, 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 always better to be overtuned than overloaded. An overtuned champion needs only a quick numbers adjust. Zeri was myrtleizing top mid and bot lane, but after they brought her back a little bit, she's out of top lane, kind of troll in mid, but a solid bot laner. Much better. Same for Vex. She started off way too strong, got hotfixed, and now she's okay. They still have the same flashy and fun gameplay, but executed more thoughtfully. That's how Riot can achieve a win-win, making new content that keeps the game fresh and exciting without breaking the game. I brought this up in the past, but I think Zack is a fantastic example of a wacky champion who isn't overloaded. He plays very differently from other tanks, but in his own goofy way. A gimmick doesn't always have to come with a billion different attributes and perks, just enough to make them comfortable to play. No more is needed. That's gonna be it for today though, let me know your thoughts on overloaded champions in the comments down below. But if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe, consider following my Twitter, joining my Discord server, and checking out my other champion discussion videos if you haven't yet. But for now, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon in the next one. Take care.